I'll introduce uh, the presentation. Welcome to ME420. Again, the uh, detail robotics design capstone presentation. Uh, this is the second of our two groups presenting today. And uh, as you can see, we have a spherical robot, which Team Incurve will, will tell you all about. They're doing okay here. So I'm going to turn it over to Daniel, maybe. Let's get started. Thank you, Dr. Eisenberg. Uh, we are in Curve Robotics, and today we'll be talking about our detailed design presentation. I'm the design team lead, and to my left I have John Sibulski, and to my right I have Michaela Stewart. Our last number is the uh, SAL, which is the Spherical Alternative uh, Locomotion System. Uh, we named this because of the uh, pendulum-driven uh, robot that we developed. Our objective <coughs> was to design and build a robotic platform for outdoor exploration. And that's exactly what we're showing today. Our outline for this presentation is as follows. We're going to cover the design requirements and what we try to adhere to during the design process. We then cover the final design uh, that's in the pendulum for now and in this year. We'll look at the internal mechanism and how it functions, the shell design and how we manufactured it on campus. We'll talk a little bit about the dynamic modeling and how that uh, led us to have the ability to actually drive. We'll talk about the simulation that we developed a little bit, and then the controller, which we wish to implement. Uh, we'll go into the electrical system, and then talk about conclusions, and then take questions. John will now cover the design requirements and specifications. Thank you, Daniel. We had a number of requirements and specifications. The majority of our specifications were just actual quantifiable numbers that you meet our requirements for. Our first requirement was to be built under $500. That was the budget uh, allocated to us. We may as well do our outdoor environments, and we used Prescott averages for our testing. We must be able to deploy in any orientation. For those who have been deployed or seen the police robots from DOD, etc., flip it upside down, it can't move. We'd like to overcome that problem with the sphere of world. Next, at minimum, it must drive on a flat surface. As, once it can drive on a flat surface, we're able to move on to more complex training, more gravel, and more boulders or engines, such as in Afghanistan or Iraq. Next, we must be able to collect and record data, because if it doesn't collect and record data, it's kind of useless. We must be able to accept past basic commands. Basically, what we're going to be using is not going to be an engineer, not going to be a scientist, it'll probably be some grunt on the ground, the grounds, some security guy from you know, Blackwater. So it must be easy to use. More importantly, simple to use makes it they're not going to try to break it because they don't want to be here. Not that I've ever done that in my defense. We must be able to fit through a 32 inch door so we can get in and out doors. More importantly, we can be able to get to a back of Bradley or a Humvee, depending on what you're doing. Was also able to form outdoor localization so we know where we're at and it can report data back. Are we stretch goals? These are the goals that if we can make them, we had a time and we had perfect idea with no troubleshooting issues, no debugging, that we'd like to try it, we'd like to uh, accomplish. We want to use all commercially available on the shelf components from Civic MasterCard, JPO, Mauser to help with field serviceability and manufacturing, cut down costs. Next, we must be able to expand the sensing uh, capabilities. So you can say, hook it into a chemical sensor to go into a chemical environment, say for the new re uh, reactor, uh, reactor disaster at uh, Fukushima, you can put a re uh, re re Geiger counter on it to detect radiation. That way, humans don't have to go in there. And other numerous hazardous environments, and we can customize the payload. Next, we must be able to have a user interface to transmit commands and receive telemetry from the robot, like the uh, UAV or any other mark type box, pack box that you use. And finally, we must be able to detect 
and to avoid obstacles autonomously. So if the user is asleep at the joystick, it's not going to destroy anything or run into, say, an IED or anything like that. I'll turn the uh, sign over to Kayla. Thank you, John. As you've been told, this is a pendulum-driven spherical robot. So for us, the pendulum was very important in its local Considerations we um, took into account when designing it was to maximize the length in order to maximize the torque of the pendulum, the lightweight, the strong in structure. If only one person is, only, is using this, they need to be able to move it and the mechanisms inside need to be able to move the entire system itself too. The manufacturability was for it to be easy to be manufactured, replaced, and repaired. Finally, affordability and weight were important. Uh, affordability with a $500 um, budget, it helped us, or we really wanted things to stay within the budget. But also, if you were ever to do it commercially, you don't want to have something that's multi-million dollar and not really work, but be affordable and reliable. And then finally, with the weight, the weight is important with the balance and with driving itself. The primary star components, which are inside, are we have the motor half and the non-motor half. In the motor half, you have the drive wheel with a interface for the hub with the motor, the side which has a motor mount for one of our motors that will handle moving this far along its axis, and then a center motor mount which handles moving the pendulum around that axis. Then the non-motor half expands to the other side so that it spans the entire diameter of the robot, the drive wheel with space for the switch to be accessed from the outside of it as it's a completely closed system and a bearing which allows for this bar to move and then the Cinti with a bearing um, hole as well for the slip ring to go through and allow it to connect to a motor outside of it. Sometimes throughout the semester we try longer pendulums uh, different motor designs and then finally settled on a reprinted model. We started with wood and aluminum for a strong but lightweight and then we were able, we thought about using the 3D printer as a way to be for exotic ideas and then for it to be very all one piece and much stronger that way. This is the final pendulum side. This is what is inside of our shell here. As you can see, everything fits together. The sides with the centers are with a cunning groove um, starting and then a bolt through two pieces to keep them together. These are the CAD drawings of the components and the things you can see how they are put together. This is the groove side and then the center with the groove and the tone and so there's places for everything to be just assembled and put together. Uh, we wanted it to be easy to assemble and disassemble. So inside of the pendulum is what holds all of our electronics. The motor hub is attached to the pendulum and goes through the motor. We have our battery pack at the bottom, which is our main fog weight. Used a double A's for their weight and for their capabilities and affordability. Uh, slip ring allows us to connect to the motors on that are attached to the spar. The beakable black is the heart of our project. It handles all of our processing and connecting with everything together. And the motor driver was is for our motors, and then of course the motor itself. The motor that we chose was a Pululu motor with a built-in encoder. We chose Pululu because it is a uh, reliable company. We used them before, and they all their and the motor was fairly affordable. The gearbox is a 131.25 to 1 ratio. We wanted the maximum torque we could get out of it, 
uh, as tall and is 250 ounce inches and allows us to add a little bit of weight um, to the pendulum to get a little bit better. We did some primary spar analysis um, separate from the shell just to see how it would hold up to added weight or pressure or impacts. Um, in the way this is oriented is along the straight spar is the Y direction, down through the pencil is the X direction, and then across the spar is the Z direction. So we looked in the X direction where most of the weight would be if the pencil was in a neutral state and added about 25 pounds of force thinking that would be a good um, maximum weight that we could probably put onto the spar without a snap. And we also put some into the Z direction to check for uh, shearing and uh, say impact on this side of the world. Say 25 pounds. So in the Gondisi stress test, it was pretty good. Most of it was actually, this is the motor side, so the motor shaft, the metal motor shaft is holding most of the weight uh, and stress, where the rest of it is fairly negligible. Uh, we were given a minimum of 2.3. 10 to the negative 7, but well, we just sort of put it to zero because it's so, so small. Uh, the maximum is the 30.8 KSI. It's fine for the metal, but if it was probably on to any, um, any of the plastic, we'd probably have some problems. A shear stress analysis. The way our part ends up being printed is everything was flat like this. So with all the weight on it, it was in shear. And so we wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to break in certain places. We did see that there was quite a large amount of force in those points. And looking at the material specs, it was exceeding what it could handle. However, this is a worst case scenario. And with smaller weights, it would be just fine. And it showed us a lot of where we needed the improvement of the design. And then elastic strain, as this is a plastic material, it is going to be it is going to deform and move with um, time and pressure. And so we wanted to know where it was that it was uh, having the, the greatest strain on it, and it was in these spar pieces. Later designs would probably get rid of the press design and move just to a solid piece that would be much stronger and less likely to break. now for the shell is the shell is the main driving surface of the robot. It is also what protects the inner mechanism and supports the spar and pendulum so that it can be freely. The design is modular and identical. Each one of these pieces are the same type and they interlock with each other, uh, forming a very nice pressure fit and then being secured with 440 screws along all of its edges. Each piece was identical because it made it easier for, if one was broken or de defective, it would be easy to reprint another one and wouldn't have to go in and find which piece needed to be reprinted if they were all different. Uh, all of the shell connects to the drag wheels here on the sides, and the shell opens up uh, along the, the center line here in a half um, circle, or you can take off one or two of the panels and access the inside of the robot. It is 18 inches in diameter. We started on something a little bit larger, but then moved down to something smaller for manageability, manufacturability, and for costs. And then with the decision to 
do a 3D printed model, we also had a limited workspace to work with. So cutting it up was uh, very important. So I'll do this as a CAD model of that. And inside there are places to secure nuts on the other side. So it locks itself in. Um, original design had sort of a cam lock or just some sort of just twist to go. Um, we went down to just the screw and nut design because it was more affordable and we had plenty of bench stuff. The design together on two of these creates a shape that's called a moon, which is what cartographers use to make a flat map into a globe. And so we use that sort of design to break up the shell itself. Uh, it's, each one is about 60 degrees of the sphere, so it is 12 pieces all the way around and six slices, say the orange. And at its thinnest part, which is more in the center here, it is an eighth of an inch, and then near the edges, it is about a fourth of an inch where the flanges are that connects it to itself. Drive wheels are the largest, actually one of the heaviest parts of this robot, which was actually unintended. However, as they are pretty much identical despite some of the hardware in them, they're actually fairly balanced and very strong and are also um, in width with the screws. Okay, for the shell analysis, I did about 200 PSI on two slices of this while it's all connected. I figured this would be probably the largest sort of impact force and pressure that it would probably uh, deal with with falling or with running into something and that it would be a good indicator of how well it would hold up to this. Uh, this is where it is. I use pressure rather than a point force because the pressure would be able to put it on all of it. We'd be able to see the distribution around it. So the Mamisi stress showed most of the stress within the center, which is the eighth of an inch section which was expected. Um, it was fairly large, and with larger ones, it would probably crack or break, or at least deform. The detonation is also in that area where it's thinner and where the um, pressure was strongest. But it was fairly well uh, distributed around with fourth of an inch rib sort of design that ends up happening. Finally, the elastic strain is plastic. We want to make sure that, that we don't strain it and then go past the elastic region so it can bounce back to where it was. And it was a fairly low number for the maximum. And the maximum was actually up near where the drive wheels are. The drive wheels are much more solid than the shell itself. Finally, the budget. Uh, within our budget, we actually mostly counted the gear motors and the slipper. The switch was sort of a smaller additional cost, and then all of our nuts and screws and washers were bench stock from here uh, in the middle. The total with just those parts that we thought of at first was $105.35. However, counting in the price of the 3D printing for, we did about three prints of the interior scar and one print of the shell. It came to about $1,600 for just the printing, which made us very much over budget. I'm now going to hand this over to Daniel, who will be going over to the Thank you, Michelle. For the dynamic modeling, we had a three by system consisting of the sphere, uh, that's the shell. Uh, then we have the first pendulum, which would rotate this way, and the second pendulum, which rotates down like this. Uh, we believe at the beginning of the design that this would give us, excuse me, the range of motion you're looking for. Um, and that's what the dynamics were there for, was to prove that we could actually drive the way we want to. A uh, bigger picture can be seen in your handout along with here. 
Uh, what's important to note is our vector gamma, which is our position in the x, our position in the y, pay the psi, which is our rotation respectively about the x, y, and z axis, very initial to the sphere of frame, and then alpha 1 and alpha 2. Alpha 1 and alpha 2 is the uh, actual angles of which the pendulum 1 and the pendulum 2 are going to operate around. Uh, that was the main focus of the dynamics and the controller, is how do we actually uh, understand how the ball is rolling and then how can we relate that back to what the output needs to be to create that. The assumptions were we had rigid bodies. Um, <coughs> standard assumption, even though we know we're going to have some deformation, uh, thankfully we were able to limit that to some degree. Uh, we have one contact point. Uh, we also have perfect friction in the system. Uh, that's why we also prefer to drive on carpet rather than a slipper floor that's just been waxed. Uh, and we also had a fapping constraint that we had to use uh, where it did zero work. The equation of motion we used was from the one of the run, where H is our system mass matrix, D is our vector of coordinates and centripetal terms, G is our vector of gravitational forces, and A of uh, a of gamma transpose times our Lagrange multiplier is also used to make this equation valid. Uh, during our preliminary design, uh, a lot of the designs that we went through went through this full phase where we calculated all the dynamics for them and then simulated them. In our detailed design, uh, we were low on time to do that and understood the large majority of what <coughs> happened. Um, what we did in detail, though, was look exactly how increasing something and decreasing something would affect the single parameter and then understand and maybe in total what that would do to the final system. So uh, increasing the mass of the shell, is that going to help us or hurt us in the long run? Uh, how does that help us and how does that hurt us? Okay, what path should we go about? Once that was done for simulation, we could uh, rewrite the equations in this format and then perform a fourth order of Rama Kutta, numerical integration on them, which allowed us to then uh, import them into a C++ program to then uh, actually fully show what the robot would look like driving. For the simulation and testing, we assumed that there would be a two-by system. Uh, yes, this is different than the dynamics, but this is why we were able to simplify it and then develop the controller in the limited amount of time that we had. Uh, we have a no-slip condition, the same as the dynamics. Uh, more importantly, the vector of Coriolis and centripetal terms would be uh, negligible. Uh, just like if, if you were driving your car and you were going 90 miles an hour on the freeway perhaps and you wanted to make a turn, you know that's just not possible. We know for the robot there just won't be enough torque for that to happen, so we try to keep the robot as slow as possible for the controller. And finally, the robot would have to accelerate in the direction of the pendulum points. These diagrams can be also seen on our handout where we believe that if the pendulum was pointing one direction, the robot would follow. In that case, we would have AD here, which is our desired acceleration, along what we call beta 2. And then for the next cut, we would have beta 1 right here, which would be uh, the angle between where the MG would be across here and where the line would be down here across the forces of friction, uh, where the robot would want to be rolling in this direction, the same direction it would be pointing. For the control system design, uh, there was some work done from the preliminary phase to the detail phase over uh, uh, the spring break. Uh, uh, myself and another student on the team at the time uh, developed uh, the controller and actually looked at the equations again. It turned out there was a mistake made in the previous controller and it was corrected here with beta 1 where it would be the square root of some of the squares of uh, our desired velocity of the pendulum. And then the beta 2 would be the 8 and 2 of those as well. Once that was done, we could create a matrix called R right here, which would be ITS transpose times ITP, where beta 1 and beta 2 would be operating on the ITP matrix, and ITS would be our rotation to be theta psi. B theta psi was uh, a little harder to find than we thought, uh, but it turned out that we could use our IMU to actually aid us in using quaternions and then actually finding what that would be. Once we had our R matrix, we could then take our beta 1 to beta 2 angles and actually convert them to what our desired alpha 1 and desired alpha 2 would be. For the simulation, we also had a partial feedback linearization. 
Uh, we're going to uh, not talk about this as much as we did in our previous versions because in our detailed design we decided not to look into this because of the equipment used, we used a big old black and we didn't think we could perform this operation on it. Bringing the controller to full fruition, we have our desired uh, position velocity and acceleration in the top corner here. And then we'd go through our first part of the controller, which would be a PD controller. That would give us our velocity desired in the X and the Y for the pendulum. And then we'd be able to use that to find beta one and beta two. That then, excuse me, that allows us to find R. With R, that gives us our desired uh, angles for the actual pendulum. And then we can calculate our input for the controller. Uh, like I said, we we're not going to use this at all this semester. So then immediately after that, immediately after that we would uh, saturate those. Uh, we'd saturate the control signal and then convert that into a PWM. That would be driven into the robot, uh, into the motor specifically, and then we would have feedback and then continue the process. The goal of the semester would be to implement uh, this software flowchart where at the beginning we would start the program, initialize our GPS uh, for localization, we would initialize the IMU and any, any other components that would need it. We would assume that we'd be in waypoint mode, so we kept this in here for clarification. We would then set our inertial zero, which was on the, uh, the sidewalk right outside the robotics lab. Using the GPS, we were able to determine exactly where we would want the uh, inertial point to be. And then we would set our XD and YD. We would then compute our velocity for the pendulum in the X and Y direction. We'd then read the sensors, run the controller, and then go through a set of decisions that we need to make. Uh, if we have not reached our waypoint yet, we will go back and recalculate our U and V and we, until we actually reach that. Uh, if we do reach that, we will go and ask if it is the final waypoint. If it is not the final waypoint, we will set the next waypoint as a target and come back and start this again. If we have reached our final waypoint, we can then turn the PWM values on the motor to zero and stop the controller and stop the entire robot. And then go through a shutdown procedure if necessary. <coughs> this is what the full simulation would look like and hopefully what the end project would look like as well. <laughs> For the functionality of this semester, we did develop a novel propulsion system. At the end of the presentation, we're going to fix the issue with the switch. Uh, Hopefully show you and it working. We will show you it working for sure. Um, <coughs> we also have videos if you'd like to see those as well. Uh, the main controller for, the, for this semester was untested. Uh, this is because of time delays on components that we didn't know were going to be as fickle as they were. Uh, with the GPS, at the beginning of the semester, we were having uh, good function with it and we're getting uh, good view screens, but by the end, for some reason, it was taking almost 45 minutes to link up to the satellites, uh, and that was extremely long and has slowed the project down to develop that type of controller, especially uh, now that we have to uh, cover the entire sphere and then try and test it, and then if something fails, we'll have to come back and figure out exactly why. Uh, later on, we'll talk about uh, improvements, one of those being using Wi-Fi and things like that to help that. John's now going to cover the electrical system. Daniel. Presented here is our overall block diagram. It is the last diagram you packet for people who have a hard time sitting up on the screen. We're based around the Beagle Bone Black. That is our heart and is all our control and is all our sensor integration. We have a power regulation system. We're using a breakout boards for the GPS and IMU. We're using the pull of the motors with built in encoders. And for this revision, we're using two pick chips for decoders. Moving on to our power system, 
We're using eight AA batteries, which in our frontal will be housed in here. And then we're going to run through two converters. The BeagleBone, the GPS9, you can all be sure the same five volt source. And we're using a step up and step down converter. So for future use, we will add wireless uh, charging, solar charging. We can basically recharge our batteries with our converter without additional hardware. We also have a 3.3 regulator to that controls uh, the traction that powers our pick chips and our motor inputs. And finally, we have a, uh, a Victor November Hotel 2 Sierra Papa 30 motor controller that pretty much handles our motor control. We have our power for our voltage and amperage for each component. The power is for the total. So if there's multiple chip uh, components, it's double. And here's a breakdown of our power draw. As expected, the motors consume the most, followed by the Beagle Bone Black, and then our pick chip decoders. In a feature revision, the AMX 355 chip on the Beagle Bone does have a quadrature decoder built in that we'd like to take advantage of and only the power draw from the pictures. All right, as I said, we're using Beagle Bone Black. We're using the WA 3 distribution for ARM, along with the Adafruit Python library for our hardware and our interaction. And that allows us to devote more time for the higher level control. We also made a cape, which I'll start passing around, that houses our external components and as our interface. And we use the ECAP software and the on campus PCB mode. Here's a picture of our cape, both sides, and our layout. Our cape pretty much accepts a 5 volt in to power our GPS and IMU. Our, we have a 12 volt source in that is hooked into a, the 3.3 regulator, which the original design was a separate uh, PCB, but we're able to integrate onto the cape. We have our two tip sockets for our pick chips to the code, and we also have two six uh, old headers for our, our wires to our motor driver and encoders. And finally, a uh, header for the GPS. The only part for the cape was we had to design the, everything around the IMU, so we did not have to do a major correction comparing from the inertial frame to the sphere fixed frame based off if the IMU is off center from the center of the sphere. This way, all of this is a vertical translation, so it keeps it very simple and less resources computationally for a task. We're using an Adafruit Ultimate GPS breakout board. We chose this one because it is relatively cheap. It also has a power injector on the antenna, so we can use an active antenna, which improves our signal quality for getting our GPS signals. However, toward the end, we were having issues with that, and we have not been able to troubleshoot that just yet. And we'll use that for getting our outdoor localization and navigating. And it is connected via the UART. That is not the best one, but it is what the unit has. Now for the second part of the electronics. This is the uh, Bosch BNO 055 IMU breakout board from Adafruit. It is interface of the I squared C. And this provides a fused central fusion for the magnetometer, accelerometer, and a gyroscope. Now, it has a built-in Cortex-M0 chip that provides all the fusion. So we don't have to actually take time like, well, how do we relate the accelerometer to the magnetometer? It does all that and gives us a nice, absolute return. The reference term the I'm um, using is the magnetic field from the Earth. And we're just operating in normal power mode, not only really low power ones. And we're using combined fusion instead of using each discrete uh, channel for each sensor and using the 9 degree of freedom. There's also a couple other versions that are faster, some are slower, with different power draw requirements. And we use this quaternion to help calculate our inertial to sphere, to sphere frame, our sphere frame transformation. Next up is our motor driver. Originally we're gonna have two of the same, uh, two of the same boards for each motor but we switched to a dual one because we were unable to get them at the time. And that actually worked in our favor as it reduced the wire routing within the actual robot. 
and they had to give it a nice area so we can troubleshoot easily. Additionally, we can control everything from the beetle bone, and it has built-in feedback characteristics, such as a current sense, so we can actually deliver like, hey, this is what this motor is actually drawing at this time. And did the over protection or the under protection, or did it shut down because we cooked it. So this is, we haven't implemented the feedback just yet, but that is in our up-to-do list. Next, our encoders. Now, also these buildings on campus are great for GPS reception. So in order to navigate indoors, we have to have a backup. And we're using odometry. And do that we need our encoders on our motors. Now, originally we're gonna build our own encoders and have the fun of troubleshooting and getting it to work along with the encoder discs. We decided not to go that route and just purchase it built into the blue bit. The motor is a two-channel Hall Effect quadrature encoder with 64 or 84,000 counts per revolution, depending on where you take the measurement, if it's before or after the gearbox. And we're using it again for indoor navigation. And again, it has this nice wire harness that helps us keep the wires nice and neat so they don't get snagged in operation. Next up, we did not actually, on our prelim, not think of how we're going to do our quadrature encoder. We saw that this semester, and Dr. Eisenberg brought us with uh, initially programmed with two PIC chips that were programmed to be decoders. They're an 8-bit microcontroller using Europe's to clock the encoder pulses, and it's fed out to our beetle bone via a chip register. And again, we use this to help with the our, uh, our value that we can actually use with the odometry. Our electronics budget is relatively low as we have the Beagle Bowl Black on campus that we're able to use. And then everything with an electronics, electronics budget is under budget. So I'll be also discussing our budget to date. Now, Embryol College of Engineering has provided us with $500 for our project. Now, most major companies and projects are going to have different accounts for how you charge your materials to, to help keep track. Our accounts were purchased. These are stuff we purchased, like the Beagle Bone, motors, anything physically, we need this for the project. We also have a bench stop. These are our nuts, and bolts, our capacitors, and uh, linear regulators. So anything that's part of our bench stop is ours. And we also have the internal transfer pane. Now this is for services such as 3D printing, the PCB mill. So, so just as an internal charge between different divisions, now, our breakdown is we spent $229 purchase, well under our budget for doing good. If we factor in our two bench stock items, we get to $300. Now we're, now we're still doing good. However, when we start adding the internal charges, that's where we break our budget. And the majority of the internal transfers was for the 3D printing, with the second tier of the PCB boards. We use the PC boards as an estimate as $41 per board, and that gets us three copies from PCB Express about the size of the beetle bone, two layers, you no know, silk screen, no solder mask, and that's the good estimate we use. There's numerous other companies out there that we could have gone with, but we did everything in house for our CAPE and our PCBs. All right, so we're we'll turning over to Daniel, who will give us a semester review. Thank you. So we finished the dynamic modeling and the simulation development this semester. Uh, we can look at it again if, for a new iteration, uh, but we stopped that. Uh, we published a working controller with IEEE uh, between the two phases of preliminary and our detailed design. Uh, we completed uh, the detailed design uh, component uh, as is being made, and then we have a complete bomb list. So everyone in the audience could build the robot with the knowledge we provide in that uh, Back in. Uh, we created an ANSYS model for the system to see what the structural analysis would be like and whether or not it would be uh, strong in the outdoor environment. And then we built the robot that we set out to design and build. Uh, we will, once the presentation is over, we will open up the robot and fix the small issue and then actually show you that it can drive. For the specifications, we were not able to 
build a robot for under $500. Um, we tried as hard as we could to stay within this budget range, and we did for every component except for uh, the 3D printed parts. Uh, uh, in the future, what we do is more of a wet layup with a single 3D printed part and then recreate that uh, so they would be made out of a fiberglass and epoxy uh, wet layup. For the interior temperature, the other night we tested the robot while it was working. Uh, the lowest rated component on the board is the pick chip at 120 degrees Celsius. Uh, after an hour of it running, uh, we opened up the shell and it turned out that it was about ambient temperatures. The Beagle Bone does output a significant amount of heat, but because of the volume and the fact that we only wanted to dry it for one hour, uh, it seemed that it was an okay idea. Uh, for our temperatures for outdoor uh, driving, uh, the highest one we would see is about 80 degrees. So anything above the 80 degrees plus whatever the Beagle Bone would put in, uh, for the Q in on that, the heat rate, uh, that's what we would look at. For the further design, we would uh, add a few more sensors inside to make sure that we can get uh, more accurate temperature readings. Uh, the IMU has a built-in one, so we'd look at that again and do a full temperature reading over the full spectrum of driving outside. Uh, that driving test was performed inside, so there are some slight variations there. Uh, for the outdoor environments, the other night we actually put the robot outside in the rain. <laughs> Yes, that was scary, um, and we put a few paper towels inside to see if it would get wet, um, beyond just a noticeable uh, foot puddle, perhaps. But uh, we, after a few minutes of driving in the rain, we pulled it back out, and it turned out that it was bone dry. So the pressure fitting outside did exactly what we wanted to do, and we think that with uh, maybe a little bit more coating, we could even probably toss in the water and be okay for, for quite a bit. We looked at the weather report and it turned out that we met our requirements based off of what the Prescott weather people were saying. Um, so we're going to rely on the, revi the reliability of that. Um, for climbing to 15 degree incline, we have not tested this yet. Uh, we would like to test this, however, we don't think it's uh, a necessary part of the project at this point. We would like to focus on uh, tuning the robot to actually drive properly and try a few different uh, controls on it and see exactly what it'll look like and whether or not we're matching the dynamics the way we'd like to. Uh, for the core job school that we tried to traverse, we're not going to test this because we think it's not structurally safe and could damage the uh, robot. Uh, for the controller, we were not able to complete the controller in the time allotted, so we did not pass that requirement. However, uh, a few other control algorithms have been put on the Beagle Bone and it's just a matter of time to see exactly what they all do. The current program is a proportional neural controller based off of the uh, odometry of the single, uh, the single spar moving. Uh, that's how we would be able to drive in a linear motion or control the second pendulum and actually get uh, curves. Uh, for performing outdoor localization, we said we can do this because we have uh, data from uh, GPS previous in the semester, although at the end it, we had trouble with it, we still have data from the uh, GPS. For the UI system, we were not able to complete this, although this was part of our stretch goals. Uh, we looked into it, but realized it was not possible and did not try to pursue it. For detecting and avoid obstacles, there was no uh, method that we could come up with on the time of to <coughs> actually detect an obstacle and avoid it. We had methods to detect it, perhaps hitting it and measuring the output from the IMU, but we didn't think that was a, a very safe method for the robot to continually hit every wall along its path. Uh, for the COTS components, uh, we, were able, we were not able to complete that because of the three print shell. For everything else, that is COTS based, but we decided that because we three printed everything, that's not technically a uh, commercial off-the-shelf component. You have to go buy the machine. So we did not pass that requirement. Uh, for the expanding uh, sensing capabilities, purchasing the Beagle Bone Black and having that many IOs and having the ability to connect to I2C and UR and actually having an SD card built in uh, is extremely helpful as we need to pass that requirement already. Michaela is now going to cover the first part of the future improvements. In the future, one thing we would like to do would be to move the spar motor 
out of the path of the pendulum so that the pendulum can be longer and add more weight to it and allow for a greater uh, torque to induce onto the shell. Another one would be to replace the screws with either flat heads or hex heads. Those we have found with the constantly unscrewing and screwing them back on that the Phillips heads, they strip very easily and make it more difficult after continuous use. So having a flat head or a hex head would probably be stronger and or find some alternative of connecting all the pieces. And then finally, trim the shell's weight while increasing the pendulum's uh, weight. For the shell, the shell came out heavier than we expected with the 3D printed parts and with the drive wheels being mostly solid. And so reducing that weight and upping the weight in the pendulum will also allow it to go faster and have better capabilities. Don will now go over some of the future treatments we would like you. to do for the Thank you. Well, first off, drum sprouts we use standard header pins with male and female connections, which do not launch. That can be an issue when we're doing the merchant repairs and during testing, because if we snag it on something, say a watch, a tool, just apps and minus, the connection comes out and we have no idea what's going on until we actually look at it. Nuts. I messed up. Plug it back in, we're good. First thing to do would be replace it with say Molox scanners that we lock in so we don't have this issue. Next up is I like to improve all the wire harnesses to look more professional and also be able to put more powerful components on that can draw more current and without having to worry about cooking a wire or putting the wires next to it and starting the fire within the robot, which would definitely not be out within the mix. And finally, with the beagle bone, you can include an EEPROM onto the cake, which will program the beagle bone upon boot up and configure your input output units. Moving on to our software improvements, we can. Thank you, John. As you said, we'd like to use the built-in quadrature encoders. Uh, there was a great deal of debugging when we had another piece, another, another chip on, that would mean another layer of software. Um, we think that using the built-in quadrature encoders would be actually easier in the long run, and for debugging that would be easier as well, because we don't have to add in the electrical problem on top of the software problem. Especially with the mechanical, ne mechanical connection with PDIP, um, that's become an issue as well, because we are rotating the pendulum, and it's going to have some flex during it. Uh, we'd also improve the data logging, so we would, rather than dropping to a text file, and then taking the shell components off, and then SSH into the beagle bone, and then getting the text files back out, we would like to use Wi-Fi to see what it would look like in real time. Um, and as a backup, we would then use the SD card uh, to store our data. Are there any questions? Actually, we designed this before we saw the movie. Gotcha. But when it did come out, we did look up 
Well, how did they actually how did put they that? <laughs> it turns out it's completely different than what we are. So, um, uh, again, it, 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 so I kind of follow up on what Natalie said, having the requirements up front is great. Um, uh, I think one of the things that you want to do when you're presenting this kind of system, it's a very complex system, is go ahead and put some of the details of the requirements up front. So, for example, how do we know what you're going to, you kind of you got to, you did a great job verifying at the end and saying you met this or you did not meet this requirement. But we don't, we didn't know what those requirements were until you got to that point. So as you're going through your presentation, we're kind of, at least I was having, having to guess, okay, so what does it mean to uh, be able to endure outdoor environments? So you know, in my mind, I thought, okay, some of those at least that level of detail listed, then you have a better idea for as you go for, for people listening as you're going through the presentation. Um, the same thing for like, you know, driving on a flat surface. Well, there's that many less than exit degrees. So those kinds of things. And, and then maybe some fundamental high level requirements in terms of, I think you mentioned you started with a larger size. But I didn't know whether you had a size and weight requirement from the get-go, or if it was kind of up to you on the fly. We had the 32-inch door. Okay, so that was your. That was that kind was of. Your, we wanted it to be able to right, be brought, brought in and point. out of the building and okay. to be. Uh, Being able to go through doorways. Yeah. Okay, so. There was no. That, there was no weight requirement. But there was an average. Okay. Um, I liked what you guys did again. The secondary of the structure. Uh, dynamics volume is very good. It's uh, some complex stuff. I do a lot of dynamics volume myself, so um, but it's, especially with constraints, it's good. Um, I guess for your controller, so, so I, I think at the end you summarize that you weren't able to get the new board when you did that. That's what's currently on there. Okay. And so you're. Are you able to drive from point A to point B with that control? Yes. If you, if, you, if you predefine the distance that you'd like to go to. Okay, specify the distance. Yes, yeah, so if you specify the distance and understand the curvature that's going to happen, depending on where the second pendulum is. So okay. wherever that second pendulum is, you need to then understand exactly how is that going to track okay. and actually move the full system. And if you, just, if you have those two pieces of information, then you can uh, start to build some sort of map. So you could build um, some kind of maybe perhaps a list of a trajectory that you'd like to do. So if you want to do a sign or something like that, as something you would like, but not the control. So a predefined trajectory, you may have like a series of points. Yeah, points. exactly. But in a very simple way. Yes. So as you've been able to get to the for implementation and using the simulation that you did where you actually went through a variety of, of waypoints, um, in that case, you still have to have the full knowledge of your environment, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, map. Um, exactly what do you mean by global map? So in other words, let's say I grabbed a bunch of stuff and I threw it out in the environment. <laughs> uh, we would not be able to avoid certain things like that. that that's, that was an issue. That I know you talked about sensing uh, yeah. at the end, but I guess the point is, in order for you even to traverse through a series of waypoints, you had to know that part of the waypoints on based on some global knowledge. Well, that was predefined by the GPS, where we defined what the virtual coordinate system would be. Okay. Um, but there was no uh, some things localization and mapping okay. done. I'm thinking some maybe a little bit higher or at a higher level that, that's okay. guiding your path planning, in other words, yeah. for you. So there's no path planning. Not the way that I don't think you're going to do it. Okay, all right. That's fine. Because there's, there was, the, if you're talking about like obstacle points or something like that. Yeah, well, I mean, that would take, I mean, that would, you would take into account obstacle points if you, if you had that type of algorithms. Yeah, we didn't take into account that. Okay. That was part of the stretch goal that we were having trouble meeting, even though we did because of the stretch goal shape. All right, so let's say I'm going from point A to point B. Okay. And using the currently implemented how far am I going to overshoot point B? In other words, what is its 
what is the accuracy that we can land with the point on the spear? Uh, from the last time we tested it, it was approximately a foot and a half. Okay. But the, that also, then again, we haven't been able to tune it hundred percent. So we have some training implemented, but uh, with the time requirements, it's hard to take the shell off, retune, uh, and try again, and continue on. I got you. Um, let's see. Just uh, one, one more uh, recommendation in terms of presentation. Um, since you have a sphere uh, near the front, I know that before you did all of your uh, stress analysis, you talked about coordinate system. It would probably be good to show what is your general coordinate system on your actual, when you have your rollout of your, your, your diagram showing your internal component. So X, X axis is along you know, the, the primary frame, you know, Y. So, but overall, it's really great. The only other parting comment, which I hope I don't steal your sound earlier, is, is the budget on no. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, it's one thing to exceed budget, but I believe you guys exceeded by quite a bit. Okay. Well, full time. So, um, it's just something that, that it, was, it was unforeseen, right? Uh, so actually, during the entire detail design, we were under the assumption that our reprinting cost would not be in our budget. Um, okay, so see now that's so that was that was not in our budget. However, however, when we talked to them, said, "Can you please give us the actual uh, cost of it?" They say, turned around and said, it would "Be about sixteen hundred dollars." So we had to sit down and figure out whether the school could actually pay that, and whether or not we could take that amount difference. Um, we included it because we felt that that was fair for the audience and that it, that's exactly how much the project would be and we're not going to try not to. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's fine. It, it sounds like maybe just a miscommunication from the end of it. Uh, the only reason I pointed that out was it's not on the requirement of the list. So um, obviously it wasn't your fault here, but it's just, uh, it's just something uh, that when you go forward into your professional careers, Budget becomes extremely important. And, uh, you know, I work for NASA for the tour is over, you know, nine schedule over budget. Uh, it's just something that, that, that you're going to get hit on a lot. So, yeah, okay. that's all I have. Great job, though. This was a fantastic one. Okay. See, I'm, I'm Jeff, Very good. I'm Jeff Jansen, playing well, or else they Phoenix. But I want to give you time to make your switch here. So, I just want to say great presentation. Yeah, you guys can go ahead. Um, you answered some of my question about, uh, you said you had a trellis structure versus you just trying to install a piece so weight isn't just in the way to the full range of the trellis. Uh, you talked about your stuff about the most important conditions, thank you. Uh, I really just want to ask one question. So, given the complexity of the design and the construction, frankly, is there anything in here that concerns you guys about like a, I mean, this is a time of meeting because you wouldn't want to have a single point of failure. So is there something in the design that you discovered along the way that you have a concern about a single point of failure and something that you do differently in that regard? Yes, um, there were a few. Uh, the two main ones that we really took under consideration and made uh, changes to even uh, within the testing phase was the support structure. We wanted to Supported even more, so we talked about putting uh, uh, putting wood or uh, that to actually strengthen the interior here. So we would actually line this with a uh, like a deposit, make it a deposit fiberglass. Um, uh, additionally, we were worried about the switch assembly, um, given the depth of the switch, uh, it could cause shear, and that's actually the failure that we did see. Uh, so to fix that, we actually pushed the switch in deeper, uh, and that's one of the reasons why it caused a different failure. So, um, it, well, it fixed one thing yeah. and found another problem, yeah. but uh, now we have a better understanding of exactly how we're going to be able to fix it. Uh, uh, there were some initial wiring problems with the subframe just because of how uh, small the wires are and fine they are. That's why my fat fingers. <laughs> yeah, but we, 
do have three fingers, and it's hard yeah. to do sometimes. Um, that's why we need to look at more of a connector system and stuff like that. Uh, the cost of stuff for is obviously it's just exponential, so you can exactly what you're looking for. And the size requirements is also very low. But the